The Earth as a Moving Car Everyone knows that a person may be sitting in any kind of a vehicle without noticing its progress, so long as the movement does not vary in direction or speed. In a car of a fast express train, objects fall in just the same way as in a coach that is standing still. Only when we look at objects outside the train, or when the air can enter the car, do we notice indications of the motion. We may compare the Earth with such a moving vehicle, which in its course around the Sun has a remarkable speed, of which the direction and velocity during a considerable period of time may be regarded as constant. In place of the air now comes, so it was reasoned formally, the ether, which fills the spaces of the universe and is the carrier of light and of electromagnetic phenomena. There were good reasons to assume that the Earth was entirely permeable for the ether and could travel through it without setting it in motion. So here was a case comparable with that of a railroad coach open on all sides. There certainly should have been a powerful ether wind blowing through the earth and all our instruments, and it was to have been expected that some signs of it would be noticed in connection with some experiment or other. Every attempt along that line, however, has remained fruitless. All the phenomena examined were evidently independent of the motion of the earth. That this is the way they do function was brought to the front by Einstein in his first or special theory of relativity. For him, the ether does not function, and in the sketch that he draws of natural phenomena, there is no mention of that intermediate matter. If the spaces of the universe are filled with an ether, let us suppose with a substance in which, aside from eventual vibrations and other slight movements, there is never any crowding or flowing of one part alongside of another, then we can imagine fixed points existing in it, for example, points in a straight line, located one meter apart, points in a level plane, like the angles or squares on a chessboard extending out into infinity, and finally, points in space, as they are obtained by repeatedly shifting that level spot a distance of a meter in the direction perpendicular to it. If, consequently, one of the points is chosen as an original point, we can, proceeding from that point, reach any other point through three steps in the common perpendicular directions in which the points are arranged. The figures showing how many meters are comprised in each of the steps may serve to indicate the place reached and to distinguish it from any other. These are, as is said, the coordinates of these places, comparable, for example, with the numbers on a map giving the longitude and latitude. Let us imagine that each point has noted upon it the three numbers that give its position. Then we have something comparable with a measure with numbered subdivisions. Only we now have to do, one might say, with a good many imaginary measures in three common perpendicular directions. In this system of coordinates, the numbers that fix the position of one or the other of the bodies may now be read off at any moment. This is the means which the astronomers and their mathematical assistants have always used in dealing with the movement of the heavenly bodies. At a determined moment, the position of each body is fixed by its three coordinates. If these are given, then one knows also the common distances, as well as the angles formed by the connecting lines, and the movement of a planet is to be known as soon as one knows how its coordinates are changing from one moment to the other. Thus, the picture that one forms of the phenomena stands there as if it were sketched on the canvas of the motionless ether.